Welcome to the Activate World podcast, a series on how business leaders have more power to solve societal issues than any elected official. We explore business activism with substance and depth of thought. We're excited today to have Michaela Ayers with us. She's a diversity advocate as well as a business strategist and social justice facilitator. Michaela, welcome to Activate World. Give us a glimpse into your background and experience and how you relate that to diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. Thanks, John, for having me on. Um, In terms of my background, uh, I've been a facilitator for probably over four years now, working primarily in the HR tech space. Um, So a lot of my role in the past had been focusing on coaching um, and really helping executives and HR leaders make strategic decisions around compensation. A few years ago, I took a detour into diversity inclusion, um, just partially out of passion um, as a woman of color, just feeling really affected by policies and procedures and practices of organizations. And then also having the, the ear of an HR VP and an HR manager, hearing hearing some of the language and struggles that cultures have. Um, so that gave me a lot of interest into um, joining the diversity task force at my organization, Payscale. Um, so that, had, that has been a really kind of eye-opening journey in terms of um, what does it truly take? to change a corporate culture? Um, What are some of the um, really key differentiators in terms of making a culture shift outside of my work? I have been um, starting an organization or building an organization called Nourish, um, which has the same mission of building an inclusive culture, but with community. Um, So Nourish is really focusing on individuals, um, people who maybe their organization doesn't, can't afford to put them through diversity training, um, or people who just want to have a conversation with someone around our differences. And so that's what led me to create a space for people um, to come together. And, you know, a little bit deeper into my background, I have, you know, worked in service for my whole life and um, have always been a person who finds joy in taking care of other people. Um, And so for me, it really came down to, you know, after the 2016 election, like a lot of folks, I was just like, wow, we're not talking to each other. Um, People are really feeling isolated. Um, How can I create a space where people can feel connected? Um, What does it mean to connect people? And it just kind of led to more and more questions. Um, And it really centered for me around my own family's history of coming together over a meal, having conversations together and really building trust and connection. Um, and so that was kind of the um, the spark um, that led to Nourish and then kind of has led to also in my professional career, um, really wanting to explore what does belonging mean um, in the corporate space and in a community space. After you graduated from college, you started working at Payscale and had an opportunity to get involved with their diversity and inclusion task force. Was there something that really inspired you to get more involved in that initiative? I think for me, it wasn't necessarily a single moment, but it's a lifetime of experience. Um, as a black woman, it's just something that it's just something that I live every day in terms of um, knowing what it feels like to be the other, um, knowing what it feels like to be the only person of color in a room, in a corporate setting, in a class setting, um, in a community setting on a pretty regular basis. Um, and so just noticing the inequities and noticing that some people have the language to talk about it. Um, Some people don't have the language to talk about it. Um, And I am a really big fan of the writer Eula Biss, who um, she says, if you can't talk about something, you can't think about something. And I feel like that's really true. If you don't have the language to really coach people through um, how to really empower people who are oppressed um, and really lift up the communities who are often not thought of or not invited in. Um, I think that's, that's the only way that you can actually shift a culture. Do you feel that college was an open environment to have those conversations around race, diversity, and inclusion? You know, when I was in school, it was not something that was a, there was not an open forum around diversity and inclusion. And I did go to school in the Midwest. I went to school in Kansas and KU. And, you know, it's a liberal arts college and I got my degree in art history. So 
the dialogue was more so around um, like art and like the history of art for me. And like the context of it was never about um, otherness. It was always centering Western culture and whiteness. And so that, because that's the norm in terms of education and what we learn in school. And so there was no questioning of it. And there was never an acknowledgement of the lack of diversity um, in my classes or in the environments that I was in. Um, And so it was just kind of that cultural assimilation that so many people do um, who are other when they come into an institution. So fast forward to going to work at Payscale and having that opportunity to get involved in the task force. I believe you said on LinkedIn that you viewed the task force as an opportunity to address how individuals can bring their whole self to work. Tell us a little bit about what that means to you and how your task force approached that. Absolutely. There's typically more risk in being your true self if you're in a room full of the majority. Um, And so from my perspective, it's giving people who are typically on the outside the chance to come to the inside um, and really be honest about their experience, um, to feel psychologically safe, um, to feel seen and heard and not feel challenged by um, being the only person and not also not being accountable to say, you know, of course, I can't speak for all brown people. So it's kind of like that balance, right, where they are individuals, um, they're speaking from their true experience, they feel safe to, to speak up in, in, in the moments where they are potentially being challenged by a bias. Um, so that to me is how I would describe it. Um, And then from the task force perspective, you know, when we started it, I asked everyone to answer that question because I think that the intention behind it is different for every person. Um, But really it was, there was just like that common theme across all of everyone on the team in terms of um, wanting to feel safe and heard um, and really seen by their peers. And so we went about that in a few different initiatives, um, focusing on training, which is the the project that I led, um, focusing also on metrics. Um, and then we have a, a program called a championship, which is really a, a mentorship program. Um, so giving people the education they need, I think, is the very first step. Um, and then being able to measure what is the impact of that or, and also, what is the sentiment of the company um, when it comes to um, pursuing an inclusive culture? How does that make certain people feel? Um, and then with the championship program, really trying to connect people who wouldn't typically be connected, um, really trying to give people allies and champions for advancement professionally. Um, so those were our pillars over the first year. Um, and it was really a really it was a great experiment, and we saw a lot of really positive outcomes. Um, so I was really proud of the work that we did in the first year. As the program rolled out, what were some of the aha moments, both for you personally and for some of the other members of your company? I think the biggest aha moments are that it really has to start with the executives. It really has to be a top-down approach in order for it to be successful. Um, people really want to see their leaders modeling and embodying these principles of inclusion. They need, they want to see what it looks like. Um, and so that was one of the big lessons for me, um, getting the executives bought in and really trying to understand what does inclusive leadership look like. Um, we don't, we're living in a world where we're really defining that right now. Um, and so I think that gives every company a very very unique opportunity um, to coach their leaders into um, being better. Um, so that was like the very first thing. Um, and then I think the the data piece is always really interesting. You know, I, I'm, I have one of those brains that I'm always interested in, like, what are the numbers saying? Um, and so to be able to capture that in a sentiment survey um, and do it on a regular basis to really see if you're moving the needle, I think is impactful. Um, but then the other side of that is not being too reliant on the data, um, not feeling like you have to produce a number because there are all going to be times when um, you have, you're experimenting um, and you can't rely on a science when it comes to human connection. So I think there's always that balance. And um, those were my really big takeaways after this year um, when it comes to the projects that we launched. I know in a panel that you recently were involved in, you mentioned that it covered two of your favorite topics, which were intersectionality and inclusion. How do you put these into practice? Right. Well, I think another way to say inclusion is just including people. You know, whenever I am seeing a movie or like um, 
listening to a song or, you know, I'm thinking about who is not being centered, like who is the other in this situation? Um, how can we include those people? Um, and so that comes into play with intersectionality because we all have so many layers of our identities um, and really trying to give that lens to especially things like politics or education or professional development, you know, the, the statistics are just showing us how important representation is. And so intersecting that idea with people who are typically uninvited, I think that is a way for corporations and communities to really actually start to build inclusion. And I think that mindset, those two things are so interconnected. There's no way to pull them apart. What do you think some companies get wrong about diversity and inclusion? I think the most common theme that I see, especially in technology, is the need to get people in the door for recruiting, um, like the trope of, you know, not finding the diverse talent, the talent pool's not diverse enough, um, and then that leading to a more, homo like that's just continuing a homogenous culture. Um, that's something that I see a lot. Um, and so trying to, at least from my perspective, I think the error in that is, sure, you're going to find someone who is diverse and does have the skill set that you want, and you're going to get that person in the door. Um, but what's going to make them stay? Now that you've got them here, like they are going to walk in the door and look around and realize really quickly um, what kind of environment that they're in. And so that's why it, I think it's kind of putting the cart before the horse to really go for from that pr recruiting perspective. Maybe it's for quotas. Um, maybe it's for, you know, to, to really serve a purpose because we know that diverse teams perform higher than homogenous teams. You know, we know that people who have different ideas, like really intersecting people um, who think differently together, those teams perform best. There, there's just so much data out there that proves that. Um, so I understand the incentive and drive to say, let's try to recruit a really diverse talent pool. But you have have to start with the intention of inclusion um, because those people are not going to stay. Um, so really thinking about what are our policies, what are our practices, um, how are people making decisions in interviews, um, how are we writing our job descriptions, um, really thinking about internal policies that you can change first um, because it really shines from the inside out when it comes to attracting that talent to your actual organization. If I'm a prospect going into a company and I want a culture of diversity and inclusion, what should I be looking for? I would be looking at who's on their executive board, who are their directors, who are their managers, what are the demographics of those groups? Because, you know, traditionally, people of color are not in leadership positions, just as a fact, like in terms of representation. And so that's what I would look at first is who's actually making the decisions at this company? Um, have they have they made any commitments individually outside of their company to actually promote inclusion? How bought in are they? Um, because that's going to tell you exactly the type of environment that you're walking into. Um, because if the executives don't care, then the company is not going to actually make a difference. You know, it's like you can't, um, the person who's leading the company has to body the principles um, in order for it to actually be an effective culture. Where should business leaders begin on addressing diversity and inclusion if they haven't already? I would say start with what is your intention? Like, what do you want to learn? What do you feel like, um, what are the obstacles for, for you when it comes to coming to a place where you might have to give up some of your power, right? I, and I think that's, that's the challenge for a lot of people is realizing that inclusion means you might have to give up your seat to make room for someone else. And I think that's uncomfortable for some people. Um, but the whole idea is to get uncomfortable because that's what will need to happen in order for inequities to become um, equalities. So that I think would be the very first step. Just center yourself around your intention um, and be aware of your discomforts, but then also be willing to step into it as a leader um, and really be willing to transform your culture. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your community venture called Nourish. What is Nourish and its intent? 
Yeah. So Nourish is a social impact organization um, who the goal of Nourish is really to bring people into a community conversation about race and other forms of difference. So it's facilitated over a dinner party. Um, so bringing different people in, total strangers to come together um, and really just get curious about each other and, and their other experiences. Um, what does it mean to be white or black? Um, what How does that feel? Um, what are some of the stories around race that you've heard, um, who was with you. You know, it's really about creating a space for people to come um, and then really opening up that space for that type of vulnerability. So that has been the focus of Nourish. Um, and it's really, for me, it came from a kind of realization that a lot of diversity and inclusion training doesn't feel good, right? <laughs> like you're in a conference room, um, it feels kind of um, robotic in a way. And it's such a tender topic that I realized that, you know, in order to do it really right, um, we need to be superhuman together. And everybody has a connection to food. Everyone has a memory of a meal that someone they loved made for them. Um, that's like one of the memories that we can call on when we smell something. It can take us back to that moment. And so I was really thinking about that psychology and I was really thinking about um, like, what does safety mean? How can I create that? Um, what does bravery mean? How can I challenge people? Um, so those were some of the things that were coming to me when I was starting to just launch this project over the last year. Um, and since then, it's just been such an incredible journey, um, meeting so many amazing people, um, finding people in the community who are really, really inspiring um, and willing to dive into the topic because I think people want to talk about it, right? We've been socialized not to, and it's time to give people the language to do it. I believe you started Nourish in 2017. How many dinners have you hosted so far, and how do you find a different mix of people each time? I've done 11 dinners so far, and people find me through the community. So they register on my site. And then through that community, there's around 150 people. Um, and I post in that community when I'm doing events and where, how they can buy tickets. So that is how the model is working right now. Assuming most people coming to the dinner don't know each other, how do you get those conversations started? Absolutely. So, I mean, like any good party, it starts off with a happy hour. And I mean, I will, you know, a few cocktails definitely help um, take the edge off for everybody. Um, and I think that I'm a really playful person. And so I try to, in that happy hour, infuse elements of play. So how can we, you know, for that very first hour, like kind of relax and, you know, take think about the day, but like take some of that off and um, not talk about work. Let's talk about something, you know, that that brings you joy. Um, so it usually starts there. I really put a lot of intention into um, greeting each guest uh, like with my authentic self. Um, and then from there, after the happy hour, we sit down for dinner and it's really, um, you know, I do a lot to ground the space um, and make sure people feel safe. And so that's typically, I think, most connecting to our bodies. So doing a little bit of a breathing exercise giving people a, a moment to really settle in. Um, and then it's just a series of questions from there. In these settings, do you get to a point where some of those barriers start to disappear and people begin to get grounded in some better understanding? Absolutely. I mean, I my approach is I just rip the Band-Aid off <laughs> right from the beginning um, and talk about what race is. So race is a social category. It's not a biological category. And I break down what that means in terms of what we've been told is that there's five classes of humans, white, yellow, red, brown, black. This was created in 1776 by a social, he was an anthropologist, uh, Johann Blumenbach. He created the concept and then it's kind of exploded and created this social construct that we're living in today. So I start from a historical perspective, um, grounding people in a few historical facts and then talking about, you know, the Human Genome Project and how that essentially debunked race. Humans are 99.9% .9 the same. Um, there's more genetic difference between a flock of humans or <laughs> a flock of penguins than there is between humans. So starting from, starting from the biology, um, but then also talking a lot about the psychology, right? Like we've been conditioned, um, to essentially hold up these hierarchies based off of the culture that we live in. Um, and that 
is real. So while it's not biologically real, it is a social construct. And as you see the dinners unfold towards the latter half of the evening, what transformation do you see around the table? I see a lot of, you know, when people come in, the body language is different. You know, people are a little bit more guarded. Um, people are a little bit more, they're, you know, typically what I see, honestly, when I, whenever I talk about this or whenever I'm around people, you know, people are like holding themselves or they're, you could just tell that they're physically uncomfortable. Um, but once we start getting into it a little bit more, you know, people are laughing, people are, you know, they're letting their, themselves kind of let their guards down. There's a lot more vulnerability. And I think that is such a distinct difference that I can tell like a, right, like an extreme before and after um, the difference between how they walk in and how they walk out. It's just like a confidence to know, like, I did it, you know, like it's, it, I did this thing that I know is been really hard for me. Um, and that gives people the confidence to do it again with someone else in their life, whether it's their family or friends. Um, and I think that's the tangible thing that I always look forward to at the end, just like having people laugh and smile and hug each other and make connections um, as, as a kind of great tangible outcome. Yeah, coming back to the point of being their whole self, Right. Yeah, exactly. And that's something that I feel like is like we don't have enough opportunities in our culture to really let our guards down. Um, I was doing I was listening to this TED talk the other day and they were talking about, you know, how humans we essentially have um, four different ways that we communicate. Right. We can read, we can write, we listen um, and we can talk. Um, and throughout all of our the majority of our education, we're learning how to read and we're learning how to write. Um, and there's not a lot of focus on speaking and listening. And so um, I do a lot of work, too, to make sure that people are listening to each other, that everyone has a chance to talk. And that also feels like a really great um, accomplishment at the end of a dinner with 10 people that you don't know. You get to hear from every single person and you get to be heard. And that's, again, just something that in our culture, it doesn't happen enough. What's your hope for Nourish and for the people after they leave those dinners? I mean, my hope for Nourish is to change the world, just to just a minor goal. But I mean, my hope for Nourish is to really see what it looks like to have a inclusive culture. And, you know, I've been doing my own personal study into the history of social movements. Um, what does it take to really empower a group of people to make change? Um, and that's really my ultimate goal is to have a community of educated people who can speak to, about their experience and feel active in their communities. Because um, that I think truly could change our society. Um, what I hope people will do after they leave the dinner is tell someone about it, and then change change one thing about their behavior. Um, and what I mean by that is, like, again, we've all been conditioned to behave in a certain way, implicitly and explicitly. If you realize that you have some of these behaviors, how can you go about unlearning them? Um, and so really trying to shift those behaviors and patterns um, into an inclusive behavior, that's, that's my ultimate goal for individuals after they leave. Well, Michaela, thank you so much. Your joyful personality comes through as well as your curiosity and your stilliness and trying to make a big change in the world. Thank you for taking the time to let us get a peek into that here at Activate World and hopefully inspire some of our audience to either get involved with Nourish or try to do some of those things in their own communities. Well, thank you for inviting me into the conversation and putting this series of diversity and inclusion on. I think a lot of people are curious about it right now. It's it's one of those things that is going to keep coming to the surface. And so, you know, as much as we can learn about it right now is is, I think, the thing that we can do to really shift the culture that we're in. Listeners, we'd love to hear from you. What is the key leadership trait to promote diversity in your workplace and community? Give your insights and perspectives in our Activate World LinkedIn group. If you have not joined, a link to the group is in the show notes. Let's continue the conversation. Be sure to tell your friends and colleagues about the Activate World podcast. Encourage them to subscribe, listen, and share from their favorite podcast platform, Apple, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and others. Let us know how we're doing by leaving a review. Your reviews mean a lot to us. Activate World is a team endeavor. Special thanks to Kayla Waldstein and Kent Nutt. Music by Jason Goodyear. 
For Activate World, I'm John Mertz.